Psalm chapter 18. We're talking about the second coming as found in uh, Psalms chapter 18. Now, if I could break this thing down in a three-point outline tonight, it would be uh, the uh, second coming, or if you will, uh, the time of tribulation. And then after that, uh, David speaks about the millennium. And after that, he speaks about the nation of Israel being restored. And in all that doctrinal prophetic stuff, there's some practical things uh, that you can grab a hold of tonight, and it'll help you in your life. Uh, you're not a Jew going through the tribulation, but there's some things you can learn about uh, going through trouble as a Christian in the church today. Anybody here ever have any kind of trouble at all? Okay, that's why we find ourselves in Psalms, amen? All right, uh, so look at Psalm chapter 18, and I'm uh, going to read a couple verses here, starting in verse uh, number 13. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave His voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Now, what I ask you to do is you're going to read verse 14, I'll read verse 15, so on and so forth, all right? Verse 14, go. You know, if you don't have the same book, you can't do that. It's pretty cool. It all sounds like you're reading the same thing. It's good. Uh, verse 16, or, or verse uh, uh, 15, Then the channels of the waters were seen, and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them which hated me, for they were too strong for me. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. I was also upright before him, and I kept myself from mine iniquity. Brother Dennis Schleer, would you ask God's blessing as, as we're going to jump into this study? Brother? Amen, amen. All right, be seated if you would. Let me tell you something else about Brother Dennis. Back in the day, that guy was a mean softball player. He was good, man. Uh, all right, so anyways, we're going to get into this. And basically, this thing breaks down into three parts. Uh, the Great Tribulation is one of them, all right? The restoration of the nation of Israel is another, all right? And uh, lastly, one of the things we're gonna, we might get into tonight is, is uh, the difference between I don't know if you guys caught this, but look, look if you would down at verse, uh, from verses 20 to 24. Does that sound anything like New Testament salvation to you? It sounds a little different. I mean, can you say that God has rewarded you according to your righteousness? If you did, you'd be in hell. I mean, as compared to the righteousness of Jesus Christ anyways, right? And, and so it's important to note that we're going to get into some of that tonight. Uh, but when it comes to tribulation, one of the greatest pictures of trouble in life is water. Water is the thing that sustains life. Without water, you cannot live. All right, the Bible says the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. <laughs> Ariana goes, waters. <laughs> All right, and, and so you say, what is that? Water is what, guys, it is what brings life. Your body is made up of water, all right? Now, at the same time, do you understand that if water is dispensed without control and water is brought in a forceful manner, it is destructive? Isn't, isn't it crazy? The same thing that can bring life can also bring death. Uh, guys, I'll say it like this. Uh, this book brings life, amen? Amen. But there's going to come a day when people are going to hear the, the judgments from God's word at the great white throne judgment, and it will mean their eternal death. 
Why? It's a two-edged sword. Water is that way. It can bring life and it can bring death. In this particular passage, it's really a picture of death and of trouble. And I want you to look at the board here tonight. Uh, waters, I've got a couple things here. Uh, it's a picture of general trouble. All right, number one, you ever felt like you're drowning? Like when you're in trouble and things are just not right and, and man, it just seems like I can't get out of this mess and, and man, I'm just, I can't get above water. I can't, I'm swimming. I'm trying as hard as I can, but I can't catch my breath. All right. He says in verse number 16, uh, he drew me out of many waters. Did the Lord do that for you tonight? Listen, when you got saved, you know what God did? He drew you out of a crowd and he saved your soul and he pulled you out of something that could have sent you to hell. He drew you out of many waters. Uh, water is a picture of general trouble. It's a picture of trouble at the hands of others. In context, in Psalm chapter 18, what is David talking about? Suffering at the hands of his enemies. So water is oftentimes a picture of being in trouble by the hands of others. Guys, remember the nation of Israel as they're going through, who, uh, and they're running out of Egypt. Who's behind them? Pharaoh and his army. What's in front of them? The Red Sea. And what's it look like it's going to do? Going to drown all of them, right? And God delivered them from that. Uh, look at Psalm chapter number 69. Psalm chapter number 69. I, I want you to remember this. The next time that you're just sort of feeling like you're, you know, treading and you just can't seem to, to get your, yourself above water and you're doing everything you can and you're swimming and you're paddling as hard as you can and, and just it doesn't matter how hard you try, it seems like you're just still in trouble. Can I say this? The Lord will deliver you. He will. If you're saved tonight, the Lord is with you no matter what. He will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And, and oftentimes it's right in the nick of time, right when it seems like we're going to go down one last time, that's when the Lord, hey, listen, Peter didn't have a lot to say except for, Lord, save me. That was it. And God saved him. All right, look at Psalm 69. Look, if you would, at verse number two. Or look at verse one. Save me, O God, for the waters are coming unto my soul. God, guys, notice this is a theme you're going to find all throughout the book of Psalms. All right? And David describes his trouble as a man that is drowning. All right, look at verse number two. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. Look down, if you would, same chapter, verse number 14. Deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from, look at this, look at this. Notice the connection. All right, let me be delivered from them that hate me and out of the deep waters. Notice there's a, a connection between those that hate him, those that have surrounded him. Guys, if you remember, there is a prophecy in uh, Psalm, I believe it's chapter 22. You can check me on that. Uh, but in Psalm chapter 22, uh, in prophecy about Jesus Christ, it's a messianic psalm. And uh, what that means, it prophesies about the Messiah, the suffering servant. And in that psalm, it says, the bulls of Bashan compassed me. You say, what does that mean? Trouble from my enemies all around. What is he talking about? When he's on the cross, you know what those Roman soldiers do? They get around him like a little gang. And they smack him around. And they're saying, hey, prophesy, who hit you? And they're plucking out his beard. And he's surrounded. And what David is saying is, I am surrounded. You ever felt like that? Man, like you're surrounded by your enemies? You know, uh, I hope you never feel that way at church, amen? <laughs> if you do, you're probably in the wrong place, amen, wrong church. Uh, it shouldn't be that way. Uh, but sometimes you feel that way with family. Let me tell you this, guys. I'm thankful for my family. I love my extended family. Uh, I'm not talking about my immediate family. This is not them. But, you know, I'll tell you this. When it comes to extended family, cousins, brothers, sisters, all that, I love them. But I'll tell you this right now. I'm closer to some of you than I am them. You, you, you say, well, I'll, I'll tell you what, there's a kindred spirit here. Because of the word of God. Sometimes you feel like your, your own family is your enemy. And, and you feel like you're surrounded. Sometimes you go to work, you feel like, man, I don't have a Christian. I had one guy one time. Now, let me just encourage you. This is you. You're going, man, I've got no saved people at work. Can I just say, good. Maybe God wants you to be a light. Now, I'm not saying, I understand sometimes you get lonely. You want fellowship, that kind of thing. And, uh, but, but I'm just telling you, sometimes, let me just give you this, the Lord has you surrounded because he wants to take some of those enemies and make them friends. 
But it does seem overwhelming at times, does it not? And so David is talking about that. He talks about it not only in the psalm that we're in, but also in Psalm chapter 69. He talks about them being all around him, on the trouble being all around him, the waters overflowing him. All right, thirdly, let me say this. It's a picture of the nation of Israel in trouble. We've looked at it before, not going to look at it again. But if you're familiar with your Bible, you'll remember in Revelation chapter number 12, the great dragon casts a flood out of his mouth and God uh, uses the earth to open up and swallow that water up. Why? Because that's a literal flood where the waters are coming after a group of people that are suffering and running from what? They're running from trouble. They're running from the enemy that was too strong for them. Does that make sense? So this is prophecy, Psalm chapter 18, all right? Uh, overwhelming situations. How about this? Waters are a picture of nations. Look at Revelation chapter number 17. Revelation chapter number 17. If all of humanity's life begins with water, and life begins with water in creation, all right, it sort of makes sense that when God talks about the nations, all right, guys, you know what he says about the nations? They are as a drop in the bucket. You say, what is that? Water. All right. Uh, look at Revelation chapter number 17. Go there. Revelation 17. And we're talking about, uh, uh, in this passage, if you get to, uh, familiar with it, uh, it's talking about the great whore of the book of Revelation of the time of great tribulation. Uh, you read about that. Uh, I'm not using language that's not in your Bible. Everybody calm down. All right. If you're not familiar with your Bible, <gasps> I can't believe it. It's what the Bible calls her. All right. Revelation 17. You can read about that some other time. But look down, if you would, at, uh, let's see here, verse number, oh, well, go down to verse number five. You get the context. Upon her forehead was written, a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And it says this, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. This is a woman that's connected with a religious system that's connected with a place that sits on seven hills. You can do the math and figure that out, all right? All right, but uh, Revelation 17, look down if you would. When it talks about this woman, it says that she, uh, she sits upon many waters. Look at verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many what? Now, you know what you do? You know what most people do? You know what a lot of churches do? They go, well, the waters are this, and the waters are that. And the water. You know what the great thing to do is just keep reading your Bible. Because you keep reading, and oftentimes God tells you exactly what the thing is. I look down at verse number 15. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Now, let me give you guys a principle. It, it's, it's sort of uh, the, the principle of compound interest in finance. Now, I'm not a finance guy. You know, you like numbers, and that's your thing. See, Brother Sean, man, that is not my thing. You know, uh, I, I'd rather be doing something else besides looking at numbers all the time. I know it's important. I'm glad that guys do it. We need it. I just, pff, I can't take it. All right. Uh, but the, the principal compound interest is this. All right. Over time, uh, wealth will accumulate and will build. It'll reciprocate because of interest. All right. And, and so when it comes to learning the Bible, there's a principle that's sort of similar to that. And that is if you can connect some dots in your Bible, things will start to make sense. And let me give it to you like this. I'll give you an example, then I'll, I'll try to explain what I mean by that in regards to the lesson we're looking at. Uh, the Bible says that tongues are for a sign. Not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. You guys remember that? 1 Corinthians 1, 22. All right? Uh, over in 1 Corinthians uh, 14, or, oh, that's, that's 1 Corinthians uh, 14, 22, sorry. Uh, over in 1 Corinthians 1, 22, the Bible says... The Jews require a sign, but the Greeks seek after wisdom. Remember that? So you know what you do when you, when you put those two things together? You learn that signs or tongues were a sign given for unbelieving Jews. And that's why if you look at every time, Acts 2, Acts 10... In Acts 19, every time that tongues actually historically takes place and is recorded in the book of Acts, there's three places there. Every single time, unbelieving Jews are present. 
All right, so, so that said, you, you combine those two passages of Scripture and you learn what tongues are for. When we combine all of these things, here's what we learn. Waters are a picture of trouble. It's a picture of being overwhelmed by trouble, often at the hands of others, and it's connected with the nations. So you know what that means for the nation of Israel? They are surrounded by their enemies. Go back to Psalm chapter number 18. Go back there real quickly. Psalm chapter 18. And uh, you, you know, you actually don't go to Psalm 18. I lied. Go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24 and Luke uh, 21. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. And notice something in Matthew chapter number 24. Look, if you would, at Matthew 24 and look at verse number 8. All these are the beginning of sorrows. We're talking about tribulation, sorrows, trouble, all right, overwhelming floods, trouble. All right, waters that are in, uh, uh, overwhelming me into my soul, as he says in Psalm 69. Look at verse number 9. Then shall, what's the next pronoun? What's the next word there? They. Underline that, that's important. We're going to come back to they, all right? Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. Who's the you there? These are Jews. These are Jewish disciples he's talking to. You learned that from reading earlier in the chapter. All right, then he says this. And ye shall be hated of what? All nations. All nations for my name's sake. All right? So again, the point is they're going to be surrounded and hated and persecuted by all the nations in this beginning of sorrows, in this time of great tribulation. My, my youngest kid is learning about the Middle East, and she's learning a song that goes along with that. I don't, know, I don't want to sing the song for you. I'll probably get it wrong. But every day I come home, they're like, we learn about Qatar. We learn about Kuwait. We learn about United Arab Emirates. And I'm thinking to myself, man, uh, over there you've got this nation the size of Rhode Island, and they are literally surrounded by their enemies, the nation of Israel. And what you're reading in Psalm 18 is a great picture of what is yet to come. Look at Luke chapter 21 to get it one more time. Luke chapter number 21. Is this making any sense? All right, Luke chapter number 21. And look, if you would... At, uh, let's see here, Luke chapter number 21, and mm, there's a couple places here. Verse number 9, we'll start there. Then he said unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Look at verse 12. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you, and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues, and into prisons, being brought before kings, and rulers for my Name's sake. Look at it down at verse number 17. And ye shall be hated of who? You say, what is that? That's the trouble that David is talking about. For my name's sake. But there's not a hair of your head perish. In your patience possess your souls. What I'm getting at, guys, is that water is a picture of trouble and oftentimes at the hands of others and a picture of the nations that are literally going to surround the nation of Israel in their time of great trouble. And I want you to think about this, guys. Uh, when Noah's flood came, you know what the flood was? It was a picture of tribulation. It was a picture of trouble. All right? The Jews were almost destroyed, almost, at the Red Sea. All right? But they didn't perish. All right? Jonah almost drowned, but God, every, you know what people always say? God uh, sent a whale to swallow him. Think about this. God sent a whale to rescue him. Sometimes, sometimes what you look at and you go, I can't believe God's got me in the belly of a whale. You could be drowning. Yeah, right. right? I mean, think about that, all right? Uh, you got the, the disciples in the boat and the storm's raging and the, you know what the Lord does? Peace be still, all right? You've got all kinds of examples. Jesus talks about the baptism of suffering. What is it a picture of? It's a picture of being immersed into trouble. Uh, again, the Jews in the tribulation, Revelation chapter 12, over and over and over in your Bible, you see this thing being a picture of something, and it's a picture of God's people going through trouble. Now listen, guys, I'm going to say this right now. Uh, you know what you've got in the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, we've got companies like Serve Pro, Service Master. You know what they are? Uh, they are disaster restoration specialists. You know what I'm talking about? God and Jesus Christ are the greatest disaster restoration specialist teams you're ever going to find. 
Because you know what water will do? It'll come in and it'll make a mess of things. It'll, it'll destroy your furniture and mold will start. You know what the Lord does? He comes in and he goes, you know what? I mean, just clean this up. Let me get rid of that. That reminds you too much of the old life. Let's rip that out. That doesn't belong anymore. That's stained with the sin of the old life. Let's move that out of the way. Why? Waters came in and it was trouble and he cleans it all up. Isn't that a blessing? He drew me out of many waters. Isn't that thank- Aren't you thankful for that? Drew me out of many waters. David talks about my strong enemy. Then he talks about, look look down if you would, uh, Psalm chapter 18. Look at verse number 17. Psalm 18, look at verse number 17. And I want you to notice the pronouns. Pronouns are important in, in literature and language, uh, but especially in your Bible. And uh, earlier uh, yesterday, I, I, uh, at work, I'm in a position where I can do this. Uh, I sent out an email and I said, hey, um, I've heard worse language on a street corner while preaching the gospel. I, I, I let them know that. And I, I've heard worse language at a homeless shelter. I said, you're not going to scare me or anything like that. But it's supposed to be a professional environment. So watch your language. And boy, the next 24 hours, everyone's texting me. I'm sorry. I know I said I'm not, I, don't, I told them, I'm not your Catholic priest. <laughs> All right. All right. But uh, anyway, sorry. Just think about language and how important it is. Psalm 18, uh, look if you would at verse 17. He delivered me. That's God. He delivered me from my strong enemy. Let me ask you a question. I'm going to ask the high, junior high, high school is a question. My strong enemy. Is that singular or plural? Singular. Okay, good. All right. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 17. And from them which hated me, for they were too strong for me. Them and they, singular or plural? Plural. Okay. All right. Lacey's like, yep, I taught him. <laughs> uh, all right, so here's the, here's the point, though. Look at verse 17. It starts off being a singular enemy, but it turns plural. Uh, there's something to get in, in, out of that. Number one, from a doctrinal standpoint, he's referring to the Antichrist, the strong enemy that comes after him and overwhelms the nation. But then you've got the nations that follow him to do, go after the nation of Israel. But can I give you a practical nugget here? You've got a real enemy in the devil, a real one. He is active and he's seeking whom he may devour in this church tonight. Can I say this? He's more active in a church than he's going to be at a bar. You say, why? They're already there, man. They're, they're, they're easy. They're good, right? Uh, but, uh, but you know what you are? You can be a threat to them. You get the Bible. You let the Bible be real to you. You leave this place and actually tell somebody about what God's doing in your life. You tell somebody about Jesus Christ. And you know what that is? That is a threat to Satan's ministry out there. He wants to blind them and keep them in darkness, as the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So you need to understand that he is your enemy. But you know, you, you got some other ones as well. You've got the world, and you've got you. And you know what you can say? You can say, my strong enemy, but they. You know why? Because the world is there, and the flesh is there, and even if you got rid of the world, even if you thought you could get rid of the devil, you still have you. You've got some enemies in your life. And you know what you need? You need God to deliver you. Can I say this? Alone, we're nothing. And, 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 I, and I know we oftentimes admit that, but it's not until it's tested that we act like, oh my goodness, what's going on? Guys, we talk about things all the time that, that we, in theory, they sound good. Just trust God, brother. Right. Unless you've got the blood clot. Right. You know, just, hey, listen, you know, I know you're going through this thing. and Hey, listen, just, just trust God and, and he'll get you through this financial trouble. That's easy to say. When it's you, it's harder, Right. There, there are a lot of things like that. We look at, we go, you know what? I know that I'm weak and I just have to rely on God. You don't know that until you're actually weak. That's right. You know, I, I heard this before. There's a strength in strength. That's one that's easy to recognize. You know, when, uh, I don't mean this to be funny. I'm serious. Some of, you, some of the guys are getting up in years and you look at 20-somethings and 30-somethings and you go, man, I have that youth again. And when you're in your 20s and 30s, you take it for granted, you know, and you can do all these push-ups, and you got strength, and you got life and vitality, and, you know, everyone looks at that and goes, that's strength. Well, maybe. Physically, yeah. But there's a weakness of strength. And the weakness of strength is that you rely on yourself too much. 
And it's not until which time you literally are by yourself and it seems that everyone around you is against what you know is right that you go, God, I need you. You needed him before. It just wasn't apparent to you. Can I say this? So there's a strength of weakness as well. And the strength of weakness is when I'm weak, he's strong. And, 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 and that's something that stuck with me. You know what you need more than anything else tonight? You need to be able to call on the Lord and have a real relationship with Him. Yeah, right. I, the man that taught me the Bible used to say all the time, the most important thing in your life is your fellowship with Jesus Christ. The most important thing in your life is your fellowship with Jesus Christ. The most important thing in your life is your fellowship with Jesus Christ. It's not ministry. It's not the bus route. It's not knocking on doors. It's not street preaching. It's your fe- because if your fellowship is right, the other things come. And, and, and whenever you're just driving, you're just driven, i got to go soul winning. Listen, I've been in some places where it's, it's just like everything is just a grind, even in some churches, and, and I, I've got to be there. And if I don't, preacher's going to ask me why I wasn't there. And, and I, I better show up. And, and listen, I, I care about you all. I'll text you. I'll call you if I don't see you at church. But I tell you this, it's not because you got to be here. It's because I genuinely, it's not my way of squeezing you down and going, I'm watching you, you know. There's some places where it is that way, and it's just, everything's dry. Gotta, gotta, gotta. And that's not the Lord. That's the way the devil works. Just driving and driving and driving. Guys, the Lord leads the sheep. He doesn't drive the flock. That, that's the work of the devil. And what I'm getting at is this. You need to learn to develop a genuine relationship with the Lord. Spend some time with Him tonight. Spend some time in fellowship with Him tomorrow morning. Spend some time with Him at lunch tomorrow. I had a, a brother uh, in Christ recently tell me, you know what? I get an hour-long lunch, and sometimes I just go to my car, and I don't want to talk to anybody. And he said, that would be a great time to read my Bible. I said, yes, it would. Yes, it would. You say, why? Because I'm telling you, at a certain point, you will find yourself in a place, either because you're doing right or because you're doing wrong, well, you're surrounded. You see, you don't get out of trouble either way. If you live, listen, yay, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. For doing right, the trouble will come. Can I say this? For doing wrong, the trouble will come. And either way, you might as well do it on the right side. But when that time comes, you want to know there's a real relationship with the Lord. David had that. And he cries out to God. And look, if you would, down at verse number uh, uh, 18, or verse number 17, from them which hated me, for they were too strong for me. Can I say this? Um, you are not strong enough by yourself. I'm not strong enough by myself. We need the Lord. And can I say this? We need each other. It is designed that way. And when the Christian tries to live the Christian life on their own, and I'll just do my thing, and I don't need fellowship, and I don't need to have uh, time with God's people, it never ends well. Can I say this? I know some preachers that are out of the ministry right now, and they will tell you my problem was I lived like a lone wolf. I did my own thing. I never went to any preacher's fellowships. I never went to any revivals. I never got uh, uh, fed myself. I didn't think I needed it. I was fine by myself. And no, they weren't. Listen, if that's how it is for preachers, can I tell you, and they're constantly in their Bible to feed God's flock, what does that mean for you? It says they were too strong for me. Look at verse 18. They prevented me in the day of my calamity. Notice he calls it a day. But the Lord was my stay. Keep your hand here. Go to Jeremiah chapter number 30. That word calamity is a lot like the word trouble. Jeremiah chapter number 30. Jeremiah 30, look if you would. At verse number 7, which is a direct. If you like taking notes in your Bible, and by the way, I I recommend this. If you get a a Bible where you've got a little bit of room in your margin, all right, whether it's wide or thin, if if you want to get a little pen and sometimes just write in there, underline a word, and right next to it, put the reference that correlates with it. If you look at Jeremiah 30 and verse 6, uh, look there, ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Uh, Jose, how was that uh, labor and delivery? That was real hard for you, wasn't it? Real, real hard, right? Real hard. You better thank God Dini is not in here right now. All right. All right. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins? Like this. 
Oh, right? You know, and, and, what, and what God's describing is he's looking at the nation. He's going, they're in trouble. They're in trouble. They have no strength. Look at verse 6 again. As a woman in travail and all faces are turned into paleness, alas, verse 7 is what I'll call your attention to, alas for that day, underline it, that day. He said, the day of my calamity. Isn't that what David said? For that day is great. What day is that? So that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. All right, notice here in verse number 7, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. What does that mean? That's time of Israel's trouble. Time of great tribulation. What you're reading about, I can't stress it enough, doctrinally is a picture, while it's David historically talking about trouble in his life, it's a picture of the nation of Israel uh, doctrinally, but guys, boy, there are some amazing re references and parallels with your life. And, and David says this, after the end of all that, you know what he says about the Lord? The Lord was my stay. Here's the question. Where do you go when you're in trouble? That's, isn't that a good question? Where do you go? You know, some Christians go back to the old life. Some Christians do what Peter did, did and they go back to fishing. Some Christians go, now listen, I'm not saying it's wrong to go online and say, brother so-and-so or sisters and brothers, would you, would you pray for me? I'm not saying it's wrong to use social media like that. I didn't say that. But I'll also tell you this, sometimes it's easier to do that than just get on your own knees and pray. That's what you need more than anything else. You know, he says, the Lord was my stay. You know what I think about? It's not about where you go. It's about where you stay. We've all passed through some trouble sometimes, amen? But where do you plant yourself when you're in trouble? You know one of the greatest places to come? I know this is real, real, real milk for some of you, but you know one of the greatest places to be at when you're in trouble is church? When you, don't, you know what? You know what? A great place to be at when you're really excited for the Lord, like Brother Sean is tonight, church. You know a great place to be at when you're discouraged and depressed and you hate everybody? Church. You know a great place to be whenever you don't want to do right and things don't look like anything's right in your life? Church. What my point is, guys, you need to make the Lord your stay. It's where you fix yourself. Now, over there in John chapter number 15, it says, abide in me. You know what he says about that? You, if you don't abide in me, you know what you are? You're dead. <laughs> you can't bear any fruit. When David says, in the day of my calamity, the Lord was my stay. Look, that's a practical reminder for you. Yes, doctrinally, Jews in tribulation. But practically, guys, I'm telling you, it's a great reminder that where you stay when you're in trouble determines how you come out on the other end. Guys, go back to Psalm 18 and let me show you this. Uh, the end of the story, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing, amen? Uh, the end of the story is the good guys win, Right? That's a wonderful thing about the Bible. We know that the good guys win. Uh, over here, you know what you've got? You've got a nation uh, about the size of Rhode Island. You say, what is this WB? That's not Warner Brothers, all right? That, that WB is the West Bank. Have you ever seen a bank that's that big? Well, your news media will get you killed. You know that? They call it the West Bank. That's a, that's a made-up name, guys. You wouldn't call the Mississippi River that stretches from Canada all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico the, the, the bank of anything, would you? Would you call it the Mississippi Bank or would you call it half of your country? You know what they call that over there? Which is about half the size of the country. Oh, that's just the West Bank. We just want them to give the West Bank. And it's not, you know, the whole country. Just, just you need to see the West Bank and, and the Golan Heights. And, and, and every time they do that, you know what their enemies do? They shoot rockets from the land they just gave them. All right, so you know what they are? They are surrounded, all right? He says, the Lord was my state. But look at verse number 19, and we'll get into the rest of this next week. But look at verse number 19, Psalm 18, and we'll end in verse number 19. As a matter of fact, why don't we all stand? We'll read it together. Psalm 18, verse 19. Psalm 18, verse 19. And it says this. You guys ready? He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. We talk about a great thing to say, God delights in me. You know why you're here? You are here for God's pleasure. Wouldn't it be a great thing to know that God looks down and goes, hmm, I like that. <laughs> That's why you're here. He delighted me. But I want you to notice in the end, you know where they go? They're brought into a large place. Doctrinally, it's a reference to the millennium and what God does for his people. But can I say this practically? It's a reminder for you. Sometimes where you're at, when you're in trouble, it seems very narrow. Am I right about that? 
oftentimes in the Bible is described as a pit or as an overwhelming flood. And it feels like if you turn this way, you're in trouble. You turn this way, you're in trouble. You go forward, you're in trouble. You go back, you're in trouble. But because they endured all the way through it, and thank God, thank God, I don't have to endure unto the end to be saved. I'm thankful for that. But I'll tell you, there's a picture of something in that. And the picture is this. If you can learn to endure some things on the other side, you come out in a large place. God will bless you for it. I don't know what trouble you're facing. Some of you may be facing trouble, home trouble, money trouble, kid trouble, parent trouble, school trouble. Kids went back to school this week, and they're being reminded, I'm sure, the world is not their friend. Um, you know. But whatever kind of trouble you're facing, or you may be going, oh, pastor, I've got no trouble. You know what I'm telling you? Buckle your safety belt, it's coming. Because man is born into trouble as the sparks fly upward. There's some things you could learn from tonight's lesson from Psalm 18. Don't forget them. Amen.